Hello everybody and welcome to the mini MOOC. We're delighted that you've joined us. This week we have a film for you to watch all about a central booking participatory action research project on developing a community approach to assessing the accessibility needs of people in the rural areas. We hope you enjoy the film and invite you to come back to this mini MOOC page at 2.30 to watch and participate in a Q&A session with the central booking team. Please refresh your browser in a moment and again to join in the Q&A. See you shortly. Hello, I'm Ramon al -Bashawi. I'm your mini -moot coordinator and I'd like to present Rob Craig, our first speaker for this Supporting Community Empowerment course. Rob Craig previously worked for 16 years as an engineer. He returned to university in Aberdeen in 2008. In a complete departure from his former professional life, he is now a PhD student in .Rural, the university's rural digital economy research hub. I spoke to Rob about his work with local people in rural Aberdeen and how it relates to community empowerment. Well, I guess I uh, came to do this kind of research, participatory research, by a bit of a convoluted route. Um, I used to be an aeronautical engineer and I spent 16 years in the engineering profession. And I came back to university in 2008 in search of a, something different to do in life. And I think I found it, really. Um, I did a little bit of work during my master's degree looking at issues of accessibility between uh, the islands and the mainland of Scotland. And I think it was during that, that work and subsequently that I realised some of the things that I didn't like about the way I'd approached that research about that, the arm's length attitude that are taken to doing the surveys and I think the fact that when I did the survey and looked back on the survey again when you actually visit the place you realise some of the stupid questions that you're asking in surveys that are constructed at arm's length when you don't understand the place and the people and the history and the culture and that was really one of the main starting points in terms of getting into participatory research for me. Um, I then had this opportunity to come and do a PhD and I resolved from the start because of the nature of the subject matter that I wasn't going to approach it in the way that I'd done my master's research. Um, and it's really just happenstance that, um, that brings me to the point of, of having done the work in the way that I've done it. it. It wasn't some grand plan. It was a combination of my personal values, my own experiences, um, the influences of people that have done work of a similar nature around me, uh, some things I'd read and been asked to read and told to read or suggested that I'd read. And all of this came together to have a real sort of powerful influence on the way I wanted to approach this research. So I think because of that, um, um, as I said, it kind of evolved, and, it, and it's still evolving. It's evolving all of the time. It's not just a, uh, you write down a plan and away you go, there you are, you're doing participatory research. It's a constant process of, of, of doing things and thinking about them, trying to do them better next time, and, and looking at your behaviour uh, and the ways that which things have come out once you've been doing them in the field. I think one of the things about this work, and it's one of the points of reflection for me, is that the agenda has been set by me in this work, which sits uncomfortably with me. Um, but in some respects, um, I feel that you always have to have somebody with an agenda involved somewhere. I had a strongly held belief that um, the way in which work about accessibility had been tackled in the past was great, but hadn't gone far enough. So the work is conceived as a project about accessibility, in particular its relationship with social exclusion and how you might increase accessibility and help tackle social exclusion. And we do that from the perspective of the individual, an individual person living within a rural community. Uh, and the ultimate aim of that really is to be able to try to come up with some way in which we can understand what the picture is on the ground, what the picture of accessibility and the picture of social exclusion is on the ground in a way which might enable us to, or anyone, say a public sector organisation or a local charity, to make decisions about how they can use their resources, and in some cases very limited resources, to greater effect. But ultimately it's really about the pursuit of greater social justice. So distributing those resources so that they can benefit more people more appropriately. And within that subject matter we're deploying participatory approaches, a kind of a community learning and development type participatory approach. So it's almost a community development project within the academic wrapper of accessibility and social exclusion. So I've kind of um, conceived of accessibility in terms of two questions. And it's questions such as who can or can't you be and why? And what can and can't you do and why? So it's really about the achievability of outcomes, roles that you can take on life, things that you can achieve in life. 
And what we're trying to do is trying to assess the achievability of outcomes by knowing about the opportunities that people have to do things and the capabilities they have to take advantage of those opportunities. So when it comes to participatory action research, the starting point for me is, um, is this particular picture where you've got two aspects of research. You've got direct action and you've got indirect research. Now direct action for me means anything that anyone would do within their community, any charitable work, anything, whatever it may be. And then you've got indirect research, and that's the kind of research that all too often gets done at arm's length. But for me, you then bring these two things together, and their point of intersection, that's to me what summarises or signifies participatory action research. So, um, I believe that you um, involved people at a local level, that they became the researchers. Before I kind of got into the depth of what participatory working means, I had an idea in my head to try to form a little local research team. So I recruited three ladies, one from each of three villages, um, and that was more by luck than judgement, um, because there wasn't an awful lot of people coming forwards to take part. And one of the things I think about that is that I didn't start early enough in trying to recruit people to take part. So if I'd have started a bit sooner, then maybe there would have been more people um, uh, willing and able to be involved. Having said that, there is a downside to having more people come forwards, and that's you then have to engage in some kind of recruitment process, which means you've got to start making value judgments about people's worthiness of being involved in the project, and that doesn't sit easy with me either. And, and what were the reasons for doing it? I think um, all of them have genuine interest in trying to improve, in their words, local public transport. Um, so that's what they're interested in, 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 in being able to contribute to. Um, and I think that's some, something to do with that they've been involved in that in the past. They've lived in the area a very long time. So they've got experience of the change of the, um, the level of accessibility in their village. I was very lucky in finding these three people as well. Um, and in some respects I think it's a, it could be a little bit false because it's not always that easy to find people that can work really well together. I've got a little homespun theory here that um, during our work there were three stages of becoming. Um, the first one of those is called becoming participant, then becoming researcher and becoming surveyor. Now I've said that these are revealed stages but you know it's a bit of a, a point for debate really whether it's revealed or whether it's consciously planned um, or subconsciously planned rather. So becoming participant is where we, we, we got together as a group and we formed as a group um, and worked out how we were going to work together and what we were going to do. Then becoming researcher was characterised by some little uh, talks that I gave about various aspects of research, how to design surveys, what does it mean by information and data, what are the ethics of doing research and so on. And we also did some other things like we came to the university to do a, a day's training that the School of Education provided for us and that was about giving and receiving feedback which is a very central part of this kind of work, being able to do things and then reflect on them. And then the final bit was what we've called becoming surveyor, and that was the, the process of working up a survey instrument, which in our case happened to be a questionnaire, working that survey instrument up, learning how to actually administer that in terms of um, interview skills training and so on and so forth, and then actually going out and doing it. So we became surveyor by the process of practicing our interview skills and so on. And I think one of the really important things about becoming surveyor from a participatory research point of view is that I was quite clear that I was not going to become the researcher that wouldn't allow my surveyors to go out and do the interviews on their own if they wanted to do them on their own. Now I may have more freedom to, 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 to act as I wish, there may be less riding on it for me, uh, which enables me to allow these people the freedom to do the interviews, but it's still something that I fervently believe is a key part of, of building uh, a trusting relationship with people that you're working with in the community, not preventing them from doing anything that they choose to be involved in and giving them all the opportunities and all the help to become involved in those things. So what does community empowerment mean to you? I guess there's two aspects to that. There's what does it mean in sort of practical terms and what does it mean in personal or sort of more emotive terms. If I think about the practical terms to begin with, I think it's, um, it's an outcome, not an action. I think it's about helping people to, or working with people to help them remove the barriers to them taking part, a full part in life as it were. 
for them being able to do things to improve their, their life situation. It's about helping to overcome those barriers that we all face in life um, and helping people to understand that there is the possibility of an alternative, a much better uh, situation than they may currently find themselves in. So I think they're, um, that's what it means to me really in practical terms is helping to tackle barriers. I think in emotional terms or emotive terms, community empowerment really is a way of, in some respects, and this sounds very selfish, but as I've got older and older, I've become a bit frustrated by the fact that I feel like my life's under control by someone else at times. And I wanted to do something to see whether we could reverse that trend, as it were. The, you know, Instead of waiting for things to, to, to happen to us or be done to us, to see whether we could actually get out there and take control for ourselves. And I think for, for an emotive point of view, that's, that's, that's my motivation here, is really about trying to see whether um, I can reverse the trend of feeling like I'm under control or being controlled by something else. So how did you empower the community? I go back to my earlier point that I think community empowerment is an outcome as opposed to an action. I can't sit here and say to you, oh, I'm going out to empower the community. All I can say really is that I'm going out to try to look at the, the, the things that, as I said to you before, that are barriers to people improving the, their, 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 their lives, as it were. So look, look for those areas of difficulty, look for the things that you need to try to overcome those areas of difficulty and try to bring my sort of skills, my knowledge, my background to bear in some way that it has some beneficial effect. So that's kind of the, the high level view of community empowerment. I think you can look at low level stuff and you can think about in terms of individual people when I spoke about the stages of becoming, um, my group had never done any kind of research or academic research before. Um, so in terms of empowerment, if you want to think about are they empowered, more empowered as researchers, then I hope to think that they are because they've had time to think and discuss and to listen to what I have to say about the process of doing research. They've experienced the challenges of doing it themselves. They've experienced the fact that things aren't straightforward and simple and you know, it takes time to actually do things. Um, and I think they understand the world of the researcher much better as a consequence. So I think empowerment, empowerment for, for lots of people that are involved in different ways, depending on their perspective, depending on their experiences, their skills, depending on what their objectives are in terms of taking part. I think um, there are all sorts of ways you could look at the issue of empowerment. But I come back to my, my initial point that can I answer the question, did I empower the community? I think that's a question that ultimately has to be put to the people in that community. What worked well in the project? I think it's quite difficult because I think an integral part of doing participatory work is this whole business of doing something and then thinking about it afterwards. And whether it's part of my character, I tend to think of the things that went wrong as opposed to the things that went well. And that's wrong of me because you need to be thinking of both. But um, let's think, let's, if, if I try to think about the things that I think worked well, um, I think that we did, as a group, we, we came together quite well as a group. We uh, formed a good working relationship, one that wasn't stressful, one that wasn't um, antagonistic, one in which we were able to speak reasonably open with each other, but I think there's always more work to be done there. Um, and one that was productive and supportive. So I think that worked out. I think well, the second thing is that um, I had an idea in my head before I started this that I wanted the work to be fun. So we tried to be, um, have some variation in what we did day, uh, week to week, session to session. We would get out of the, the room that we would normally meet in. We would meet in other people's houses, in their kitchens, in their lounges. We would go to the community cafes and hold our discussions. We would do whatever we could to change the scenery, change the environment and not get stuck in a rut of boredom and re repetition as it were. So I think that worked okay. I think it needed a bit more planning though because I think one of the things about changing your, your, your location is you find that some of the things that you plan to do at the time are perhaps not so easy to do in a noisy community cafe for example. Um, and planning is a, a word that I try to steer away from because I don't think, I see participatory work as kind of you know, evolving over time as opposed to having a rigid plan. But I do think you need to have some, some things in your back pocket to pull out for the, the most appropriate setting. What would you have done differently if you were starting again? I think there's all sorts of things that I would do differently. But I think one of the things to be careful of is to becoming is becoming too prescriptive. It's really good, it's really worthwhile, and as I've said to you before, doing things and thinking about them is an important part of the, of the work. You know, this 
a sort of process of continuously thinking about what you're up to before you actually do it and then thinking about what you did once you've done it is a really important part of participatory work. One of the things though is that you can think too much about it and you can start to become very prescriptive about the way you could go about doing this kinds of work. And that might be absolutely fine for this particular situation, but when you try to transfer that to another situation, it might be completely wrong. So I would, I would try to steer away from being prescriptive. So there are there's sort of six areas that I think um, I could have done better on or I think that we needed to think more clearly and, and, and be more proactive about. The whole thing about agenda setting was an issue for me. And if I, if I go back to some of the sort of underlying ethics of this kind of work, I think openness and honesty is really important. And alongside those two things is courage. You know, you've got to have the courage of your convictions. You've also got to have the courage to realise that people might say no. And I think when it comes to agenda setting, it may have been much better for me to try to set out the agenda uh, in clear but full detail, as it were, and run the risk of people saying, no, I don't want to be involved. I think I was too reticent in terms of, uh, from a fear of uh, frightening people off, overwhelming them, thinking it's going to be much harder and much more uninteresting than, than they might have otherwise anticipated. So agenda setting is, is one that I think needs to be wrestled with. It's a really difficult thing to take this abstract subject matter and try to make up a case that people can understand and can buy into. And you can't do that in a couple of hours of meeting once a fortnight. You know, so I think the thought about how to convey what's quite difficult, quite abstract topics to people that don't have very much background in that, in that, in that subject matter needs a lot more thought about. I think the other thing was um, I had a big wrangle in my head going on about my positionality in the group, i.e. my position relative to others. You know, people talk about the issues of power in these kinds of relationships. Um, and I think I've come to the conclusion, though, the conclusion that it is a difficult thing to wrestle with, but I think it's too, too easy to become very reticent about imposing yourself or, or, or misusing power in the group. It's easy to become too reticent and therefore not be not be active enough, not be proactive enough. And, and, and inadvertently, you're, you're exercising power because you're controlling the situation. By not being open and honest, saying, I've got a problem with power here because I'm worried about my position, you're inadvertently imposing power on other people. You're controlling their thoughts almost. So I think it's really important to, to, to understand your position in the group and to, to, to discuss that amongst you as a group and to get that settled, as it were. And there's a guy called John Allen, He's an academic. Uh, he writes about, he's written a book called The Lost Geographies of Power. And there's quite an interesting thing in there that he talks about power among as opposed to power over. And power among, I guess I would equate to what you might consider to be good leadership or good management. People that you're prepared to work for because you respect them, because they treat you fairly. So it's trying to bring out those qualities in your relationship with your group, exercising power in that way, as opposed to issuing orders and expecting people to obey those commands. So I think that's an important issue to tackle. I think managing time is a real big issue because I said, you know, I envisage it only taking a few months and here we are, 18 months working. Late. And there's a colleague of mine, Karen McArdle, at the University of Aberdeen, who talks about cycles of learning, um, where she says, start off small and slowly build, build up the, the work that you're doing, step by step, repeat some aspects of it and then add to it and build it up. And I, I buy into this idea because... Some of our work was compartmentalised and it meant we squeezed some of the more difficult stuff down into a very short time scale. And that's difficult for anyone to work under with all the pressures of um, the promises you're making to your survey participants. You know, constantly losing your deadlines is a very de demoralising, demotivating experience. So it's important to start pretty much everything early on but start small and to build it up slowly over time and repeat it. So for example, I would have started or I would have said to the group, do you think we should start the design of our survey now and think small? Think about a small survey and then slowly increase the design as we went along and added to that things about ethics and question type and sorts of data. So I'd have tried to blend it all into one really and build it up much more slowly. I think there's an underlying value base that I, I, I kind of hold true and some of these things I've spoken about indirectly during the course of this discussion. But I think the underlying value base is something that you really have to buy into if you want to do participatory work well. And by doing it well, I mean doing it truly ethically. And that's a difficult one to, it's a difficult debate to have in your head because um, depending on the sorts of person, you're very critical of yourself. The debate can be endless and can be self-defeating. Self 
Um, so you do need to take external opinions on the positions, you, the ethical issues you face, the challenges that you're facing, to get a reality check about whether it really is a challenge. And you've also got to take the opinions of the other people that you're working with. You've got to be open, you've got to be honest. You've got to give them the opportunity to be able to speak openly and honestly about you as an individual and how you're conducting yourself. And I think the final thing, really, in terms of things that we did less well is, is coping with the sort of social and institutional pressures. Always, when doing participatory work, I found that there are always pressures upon you that are out with your control. If you're not doing, like me, a PhD, there are requirements that the institution has uh, for you to have done certain things by certain timescales. Um, they're providing you money to do this work. There's a psychological pressure that comes out of the fact that they're paying for you to do this work. There are other social pressures like managing people's expectations. Now, we did that well, but nevertheless, there were still difficulties involved in doing that. Um, and I think the other sorts of social pressures come from the fact that uh, this is a learning process. Doing participatory work is a learning process. You start from small beginnings and you build on those small beginnings. And it's very easy for people to be critical of you um, because you don't say or do the right things or you don't behave in certain ways that they might associate with participatory type activities. And I think that is a really difficult thing to try to manage, is to try to look beyond that and, and just carry on ploughing your own furrow, but taking advice, learning from your mistakes, acting and then reflecting on that action. Hello everybody, I hope you've had the opportunity to watch the film that Rob and I produced this, for this week's presentation. I'd now like to introduce guest speakers Rob Craig from the University of Aberdeen and his colleagues Margaret, Greta and Norma who together from the central, uh, were, sorry, together for, form the central book and research team. They're eager to take your questions so please post them into the discuss and I'll share them with the team. Thank you. I'll now look to see what questions you have. We should say hello quickly, shouldn't we? Hello, everyone. Hello, hello, everybody. <laughs> I do believe that we have the question from Kate, um, and she might have found the answer to that in the video, but I'll just let you know what that says. So, oops, sorry. Okay, so Kate says, were your researchers feeding back to their communities and collecting information from those communities, or were they simply representative of uh, voices? Any of you guys want to take that one? Um, I think we were representative of, of our uh, 
own communities. Each of us lives in different villages, so that um, and we did speak to people all the time we were doing it. I think I think the other, a, the other thing, of, the other thing with that was that we, um, although we worked together as a group to try to produce a, a survey instrument, um, we as a group went out and did that survey. So there's another sixty odd people um, that have been involved in this more on the periphery uh, because they were respondents to a survey but nevertheless we've involved them in it over a period of time and we were discussing recently it's our intention to go back and feedback those results to them sometime in early in the new year um, and to ask them some more questions as a consequence of what our findings kind of a sanity check as it were okay just bear with us see if there's any more questions We've not got any more questions as such, but I, I've got, um, oh, we do. Sorry, just bear with me. Yeah, um, Kate just said thank you. That's clearer for her. No worries, Kate. Thanks for the question. <laughs> <laughs> and I just, I just wondered how long the project actually took. I'm quite keen to know how long it was and how many people you involved. Well, they all joined when they were 16. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it feels like that at times anyway. I'll, I'll let, the, I'll let my, my colleagues answer that question, how long it took. Well, we began in July last year, uh, this uh, 2011, and went on until uh, May. Right. That was the intense part, and now we've, we've been meeting sort of infrequently, once a month or once every couple of months, um, in, as we prepare to go through the analysis of what we found and also get ready to do the feedback next year. Um, and I think there may be opportunities if these uh, lovely people want to continue to just meet every so often to do other things as well. I think I think we've got a participant here who likes your hats, oh, by great. the way. <laughs> <laughs> Phil, would you like to ask any questions about the project? <laughs> oh, we've got another it's one popping bit, up. Well, have you, oh, we've got another question for you, ladies. Um, have you been able to take your findings to the people who decide on transport issues? Sorry, that's for you as well, Rob. Okay. <laughs> well, we haven't taken it back uh, as yet, but we do plan to do it uh, in the new year, probably uh, in the springtime, actually. The fact that I'm going to be away for six weeks between now and then uh, is not helpful to get them concluded. One of the um, we've we've done a little bit of data analysis so far, and we're going to get together to discuss that again in the new year. But there, we tried to set the survey up so that it fulfilled a number of different um, objectives. It fulfilled some research objectives, and I mean academic type research objectives, and we fulfilled some community objectives so that we could both get something out of this. In the, in the immediate term, as it were. So there are specific questions in the survey that we did which were aimed at trying to glean um, specific issues that people had with transport and other, other aspects of accessibility in their area. So when we look more closely at that, that's the sort of information that I think we hope to, to take back. OK, thank you. Back. Well, we've got a question from Brian Robertson just saying, how would researchers feel about training new researchers and how would Rob feel about this form of academic context, from an, an academic context, sorry. Could you perhaps elaborate a little bit? I'm not entirely sure. How. Um, I, I've just posted the question in the chat, but I'll just ask Brian if he can just elaborate. Oh, I see. I could have a go at elaborating. Um, it's something I've seen um, as a community empowerment in um, third world countries and developing countries. Uh, the idea that um, people participate in particular activities and then having participated and learnt a lot from that, then go and pass on their experience to other people so that they can go and do it for themselves and it cascades down. Okay, so the first part of the question is for my colleagues really. Um, how would they, how would you guys feel about training other people to do research based on your experiences so far? Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> Depends who they were, that's <laughs> we'd have to choose our clients. 
I'm not sure I would be very keen to, to um, train someone else. It's, uh, it's really very complicated and complex in the way that it was, it was done. It was very often we felt we were two steps forward and half a dozen back. <laughs> As we, we try to learn what we were doing. I think to pass on that experience would really have to be for someone like Rob. I think to some extent, if um, uh, in terms from an academic perspective, uh, I don't have a problem with this. I mean, I think uh, you know, I, one half of what I'm trying to do is do myself out of a job in some respects, and to try to you know to try to get people out on the ground that can <laughs> that can that can do things um, probably better than I can. And you know, one of the things that I, it was quite clear when we started this work, I don't consider myself to be a, an expert when it comes to doing research. So there's not a massive gulf between myself and my colleagues here in terms of doing research. There might be a bit of difference in terms of experience, but that can be built up over time. So I think academically, I don't see an issue with that. And um, um, I think it would be a good thing in, in some respects. And maybe we need to work more closely together and train more people to do research. Mm. Mm. Nice answer. Thank you. Um, I'm just wondering if there's any more questions and just having a look at the discussion. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, Brian Robertson just um, talking about the last question that he posted. He says it's a bit like Phil is saying, a form of peer learning that may also remove the influence of the academic. I tried it with peer researchers from Glasgow training our, ours in Edinburgh and it worked well as I removed from the context. I'll post that to you so you can just have a read of it, mm -hmm. have a think. So yeah, that's just in the chat. And some more coming up there. I see the point, Brian. Thanks for that. Um, yeah, I think um, I remember right at the start with all of this when I was posing posing the sort of approach to doing research to my colleagues. They were they were constantly raising the question of um, the involvement of the academic. And I think that you know there is, despite best efforts, there's always a problem with, particularly when I came at this with having set the agenda, as it were. There's always a problem with undue interference. Um, so yeah, it would be good to remove the academic from from the equation. But I guess that depends on what the the project's being set up to do. Um, I, I, my get out clause in my particular case was it was set up partly to do some form of academic research. Um, but if it's largely community type research that's needing to be done, then equally there's no reason why the academic has to be involved. I hope that's a valid comment. Okay, yeah, and in relation to that, Kate McLean was saying, as long as the training was participatory uh, with the original researchers helping new ones to understand the process, it would work. Mm. Mm -hmm. And then we've got a question here from Pauline Jarrard. I think the researchers are underestimating the skills and knowledge they have gained. Very impressed with what they've achieved. That's a tribute to you guys. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if there's anything more to you. Oh, yep, we got another one here. Oh, we have a, a question from Pauline Jarrard. I'll just post that to you. But what it says is, does training others sound scary? Perhaps if, if you would, tell others what you know might not sound so scary. I'm not quite sure. Um, I think it means about the phrase that is. Does the phrase "training others" sound scary? Okay. It, does it sound less scary if we were if we were to say, um, "Telling others what you've learnt or what you know from from doing your work"? I guess it's the way we're phrasing the question. So that's a question for my colleagues. I think. <laughs> would you feel more comfortable if um, we said? How would it feel if you spent time telling others what you've done and what you've learned and what you think about it? Well, yeah. a bit, a bit like that. It's um, maybe not quite so scary, but it's still a form of training. And would we be putting forward the right approach? Um, thank you, guys. Sorry, I just lost connection there for a second. Um, there's a comment from Kevin McDermott saying, I noticed that one of the researchers is a di director of Book and Development Partnership, which is a really strong member organization that has done lots of participatory work, such as planning for real. Did this experience help her in the research process, do you think? Hi, Kevin. Yeah, yeah I, I think it probably did, because <laughs> it's been, um, it's quite intense in, in Book and Development Partnership. Okay. 
I'll just see if there's any more questions. Um, Pauline just said, thanks for the translation, spot on. <laughs> Relation. <laughs> of it. You're welcome, Pauline. Thank you. <laughs> thanks for the question. <laughs> um, there's not anything else. Is there anything you guys wanted to talk about just with regards to the project and what's happening and what you see happening in the future? Let's see how we work out the data and where we go from there. Mm. I think that take it as it comes. Um, and, and just a message from Brian saying, absolutely, the professional has to be there to support researchers and trainers if they elect to do so. so. Agreed. Yes. <laughs> With a good leader and Rob. <laughs> Most definitely, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I agree with that. Yeah. Especially with that party hat on. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, Phil, any, any other comments for, uh, you'd like to add to the discussion? Or We have quite a few people participating, just um, not many questions coming up just now. Um, so um, I've I've just thought of a question uh, in in the sense that the whole of this series of webinars that we've been doing is about uh, empowerment and um, empowering communities. Um, being involved in the participatory action research, do you feel that that's been an empowering experience for you? Any of you? <laughs> yes. <absolutely>. Yes. <laughs> yes. Without doubt. Yes. Can I ask you to elaborate how? Because I'd be quite interested to understand what, how you think that it's been empowering. Um, well, from my own part, I think that the fact that we've been able to go out and speak to people, um, uh, take on board what's been said from them, and I think that's, um, as I say, when the data comes out, we'll know whether it's been worthwhile or not. I agree with Norma. Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad my name's not David. <laughs> <laughs> How about you, Margaret? Any thoughts on how you felt empowered by doing this work? Well, certainly enjoyed it as the time went on. To start with, it was a bit scary, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we, developed, we gradually got into it. And you, you all feel that you've learned something from being involved, yes? Oh, yes, 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 yes. And what what sorts of things? Well, well it, it, you understand people's capabilities oh, more okay. and understand their uh, difficulties. You know, just after interviewing people, everybody has something to tell. Okay. Um. There's no more con comments coming up just now. Um, I think, Phil, would you say that we're, we're finished with everything to do with this uh, webinar? Um, or is there any more comments to come? Yes. Um, we'll, we'll see if there, there are any more comments. There's mm -hmm. no harm in us, us finishing early. Um, I'd just like to put one more question there. Um, Rob deflected that um, question, I, the last question I asked about feeling empowered um, to the rest of the, the, the group. But Rob, um, how about yourself? Did you feel that it was an empowering experience? Um, I think um, with all these things, uh, where, where you're coming to participate your action research for me has been about bursting my particular bubble on life uh, and getting out of a I wouldn't say prejudice, but a very a, a particular a view of a particular colour, as it were, and and, and seeing life from a different uh, perspective, being involved in a different environment. So it's empowering the sense of understanding people and the different uh, aspects of their lives um, from their own perspective. I think that's what's been most empowering for me. Uh, and also, um, I think now we've come to the end of the process, um, feeling that uh, you know you look back over it and you think despite all the hardships and difficulties that we might have had at various times, it's been a marvellous experience for me, really. Really, really good experience. Uh, and I wouldn't, 
I would encourage anyone who wants to do research involving communities or people to, to get stuck in and, and not get too worried about um, some of the sorts of ethical issues that I got hung up at the start. So I think it's quite empowering in that sense. Learning by experience is really empowering. Mm -hmm. I had a, a suspicion that it's not just empowering for the communities, but it's empowering for everybody involved. Mm. Uh, we, we have just got an, another question from Kay and she says, have you also s learned something about the decision-making process around transport, like the pressures on local authorities to comply with business commercial needs rather than with community needs, for example? Uh, well, we didn't... Uh, oh, sorry, Margaret. Well, especially in this uh, um, dire times at the moment, we understand that. In fact, we didn't actually in, in, encourage the uh, authorities to get involved in this but at this point because it was, to me, it was more about the communities um, and how they viewed it and from there to take the data back to the uh, council. I think the um, other thing I'd like to add to that is that we never set out to become some kind of activist group with some sort of kind of single issue agenda. Uh, what we wanted to do is to try to just understand what the picture is on the ground and if there's a problem uh, try to do something about it and if there wasn't a problem then so be it but um, uh, it's more about not trying to take sides here it's about trying to elicit the truth uh, as best as you possibly can and to do that in a way that's representative of the people that you're working for and with okay thank you and we've actually got a question here from Brian Robertson for myself and Phil and he says how have you felt and how have you felt empowered through the MOOC process and how will you take this forward? Mm. <laughs> um, I'm not going first on that one. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think the question was actually aimed at Ramon and me, um, but I think oh. that's probably better answered in a different context because this is, this is for you at the moment. <laughs> So, sorry, Brian, I'm copying out of that. That's <laughs> dreadful. I'll, I'll answer you elsewhere. We, we will be giving people more, more uh, participants more information about how we'll be taking it forward in the KTP project. <laughs> and we really hope to do a focus group later on in the project, um, in, in the new year, should I say, that um, we'll find, try and capture some of the kind of feedback from participants. So, yeah, as Phil said, we can talk about that in another area, though, but... Thanks, Brian. Can I just can I just add a point to that? Um, for me, being involved in the MOOC, um, which I wouldn't ordinarily not have been involved in, I don't think, uh, it's been a real eye opener from from the perspective of what technology can and can't do in terms of reaching out to people that can't travel or whatever it may be. So even from my own perspective, being involved in this has, has opened my eyes to what you can do with technology and how it can be beneficial if you can get around the sort of idiosyncrasies of it. So it's been quite empowering from that point of view being involved in the MOOC for me. Yeah, yeah, it's been a real steep learning curve for me too. So, but you know, I feel empowered through doing it. So, that's really good. Um, there is one more comment just coming up. Um, oh, this is really, really lovely. Um, I'll just post that up. It's a little bit of feedback. Um, just saying, I love the MOOC, especially useful here with constraints of geography, as as Rob's just pointed out. So, yeah, I think it can be used in a lot of different capacities, and it's good to get as many people. Um, experience in the Google Hangout and the MOOC in general itself, um, especially with getting you guys involved today, it's been really good. Okay, um, I'm just wondering if there's any more comments from participants. Um, yeah, um, Rob, uh, Brian Robertson is just saying, I couldn't agree more with Rob there. Thanks, guys. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, I think. Can I, am I allowed to ask one last question of my participants? Of course, yeah. Of course. Um, if you got involved in this sort of thing again, what would you like to see done differently? Blimey. <gasps> uh, I, for myself, I don't know what I would have done differently. I think some of the questions that we asked were not done. Uh, in a way to get the right the answers that we should have been getting. It was very obvious that 
when people said that they had no problems getting to hospital appointments, that unless you drive and get to get into Aberdeen for a hospital appointment, it's almost impossible. So everyone said, yeah, though they could get there and they never missed appointments. So I think something around that area would be something to to focus on. Mm -hmm. Margaret, do you have you got a, a view on that one? I just can't think of anything at the moment. Put you on the spot. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> what about you, Greta? Well, a little more time. <laughs> Don't worry, Margaret, it's fine. <laughs> it's only if anything pops. You're mean. Only if anything pops into your head, really. That was what I was looking for. So. He can read my facial expression. <laughs> Okay, well, thank you so much for coming into the university today and participating in this MOOC. Um, it's really great having you guys on here today. I um, just want to say thank you to you all. Um, it's been really interesting and invigorating. And I also wanted to thank Phil for his input behind the scenes. Unfortunately, he's not able to wear a party hat because um, he's not got that function on <laughs> Google Hangout. <laughs> so just, just to address the... Um, Mini Week participants, as you know, this is our final week in the Mini Week, so I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you all for participating, and I'd also like to remind you that this week's task is a competition with a prize. Uh, the task is to upload a picture of an empowered community with an explanation in no more than 250 words of why it's empowering. To find out more, visit the Wiki homepage where you'll find out what the prize is. As this is a MOOC, uh, this MOOC is a pilot MOOC, we'd be really, really happy if you could give us some feedback about experience, your experiences. So we'll be sending out a survey later this week. Please take the time to um, tell us what you think about the MOOC. Your feedback is really important to us and it will really help us to develop our next MOOC in change management. And finally, I don't know if you're aware, but you can get a certificate of completion for the course if you wish. You just need to have completed all the tasks. If you are interested in receiving a certificate, please look at the certificate of completion on the wiki for more information. Thank you and have a lovely Christmas and New Year. And I'd just like to add one little thing. And this is to, where is it? Because I want to just play with the sound effects. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Should we wave, wave, wave at the camera? Just wave at the camera. Bye, everyone. Bye. 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 <laughs>